Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hi, I'm Willie Nelson, and I urge you to support the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act to regulate marijuana and restore industrial hemp. This initiative will end adult marijuana prohibition and let our criminal justice officers focus limited resources on real criminals and not on marijuana users like me. OCTA will also allow farmers to grow hemp for fuel, fiber, and food to create jobs and help our economy. Please support OCTA. Thank you. In between the blues, there are good days and bad days, with everything and nothing to lose, while the setting sun never sits, and the night has no limits. The void between freedom and free, dealing with the unnatural reality, a need to see, a need to be, grass fire, my DNA. Needs THC. Grass fire in the world that yearns. That's the way this fire burns. Like a grass fire. In the unnatural society, been trying to maintain while the same appear to be clearly insane with no way to explain. Outlasting the great lie, a sparking spark does my mind. Grass fire pulling the sky, breathing in sativa's design.
It's about outthinking them. Just think about that. <laughs> right? About outthinking them. Alternative energy. Power. Power. Alternative energy. Conscious live thought. The process of thinking. Energy. We are the alternative energy that can make the change to happen. But we really have to understand what this means. We really have to get it and understand it. Then we become that power. And the power of the people got and have shit to do with the vote or any other thing. It's got to do with thinking with a clear, coherent, intelligent mind. Use the intelligence clearly and coherent. How much power do we have? Can, if you, can you make yourself feel miserable with your fears and your doubts and your insecurities? If you can do that, you have power. Simply put. All right? So it's just a matter, but that's power used incoherently and chaotically. So just think of some mental shifts here and use that power clearly and coherently and real change. This is the power of the people. Like this cannabis tax act, you vote, but you use, the voting is like using it as a tool. You know, you just use it as a tool, but your power isn't there. Your power isn't here. Look at all that money, yeah, the money that they spend. Take another look and save some time for him. Don't cut trees for paper cause it hurts the environment. Stop deforestation, yes it's time for hell. Whoa, an acre of hemp makes 20 bales of oil. No need for pesticides to poison all our soil. People got no food, they got no clothes, they got no rent. This is a compilation piece of Time for Hemp featuring the best of with Willie Nelson, Alan Bach, and Timothy Leary. Hosted by Casper Leach. <laughs> Millions of uh, farmers all over the uh, this country have been losing their farms at the rate of uh, a million a year. Uh, what, acreages uh, well, a million farms? Farmers. You know, th at one time there was eight million working farmers in this country, American family farmers. Down, now we're down to probably less than two million. Uh, the big corporations, it's the old story of the big ones eating the little ones. And uh, they're running the small farmer off the land. And when that happens, uh, the farm town closes down. Uh, the first thing, the hospitals and the schools uh, go. And then what happens is uh, all these people are now unemployed. They move on to the next big city, which causes the same kind of problems in that city. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that all the homelessness, alcoholism, insanity, all these things that we experience, unemployment in our country can be traced back to the first time that the first American farmer was forced off his land when he was unable to make a living off of 100 or 200 acres of land. Uh, and the reason for it is because they have asked him, uh, demanded, or uh, made it necessary that he raise uh, a crop below what it costs him to raise it. Okay. He loses money uh, on, uh, for instance, if he, uh, just example figures, for instance, if he were to, it costs him $2 to, uh, or $3 to uh, plant and raise and harvest a, ga a, a bushel of corn, and if he only gets $2.50 for that at the market, then he's losing. Right. And, and this is an accepted practice in American agriculture today for the farmer to get less than it, what it costs him to grow. Uh, and, and they keep trying to justify it with subsidies and whatever. But the American farmer would rather go out here and work hard and make his money the, the hard way, the way he knows how to do it. Give him an acre, let him do what that acre can do. Let him do it without all the pesticides, without all the chemicals. Don't, don't put his yield so 
low, his money's so low that he has to use every piece or every gallon of pesticides that he can find to pour on that acre of land in order to get enough money out to almost break even. Mm -hmm. uh, they have forced him into this position. There are even banks who will not loan you any money at all unless you agree to use X amount of pesticides and, and uh, chemicals on your land. Oh, really? Absolutely. Uh, because they know that the only way you can make your payment is if you get so much off of that acre. And the only way you can get that much off of that acre is to keep pouring the chemicals to that one acre. Wow. <clears throat> well, now, when did you first become aware of hemp as a cash crop? A couple of years ago, I read a book, I think that a lot of us have read by now, called The Emperor Wears No Clothes. And it was uh, uh, in that book, there was a reprint of an article. The, the, the one thing in, in that book that I saw that could not be argued with was an article that came out in the 1938 edition of uh, Popular Mechanics magazine, February edition, if okay. anybody wants to go check mm -hmm. it out, uh, that said a billion, a new billion dollar crop for the farmers. Do you think that farmers today would be receptive to growing hemp as a cash crop? Because of all the propaganda we've heard over the years, there are so many people now who believe that it's the, it's the evil weed, but we we kind of figure it, because of all the products that it can create, that it, it could be a solution. Well, definitely, I think most, most people that I talked to had no idea, just like me, that hemp and marijuana was the same thing. Uh, we were ignorant of that fact. Uh, also, we were ignorant of the fact that hemp could be used as food. Uh, it can be used as clothing. The first Levi's in this country were made from uh, hemp. Uh, the first uh, Bibles uh, yeah. were printed on hemp paper. Uh, the Declaration of Independence, the first two copies of this was printed on hemp paper. People don't know that. Now, when you're out there working with the farmers side by side, do you have an opportunity to witness uh, ways that we people who are not involved with the farm communities on a daily basis, those of us who are driving to and from work, uh, stuck in our offices, what can we do to help the farmer overcome this misery? They've been together uh, as our backbone forever. There is a, there's a great plan that just I, found, I became aware of it here uh, a year or so ago, last year, in fact. The farmers have come up with this idea themselves. It's called parity giving. Uh, for instance, if you're a rich guy, you got millions of dollars, you want to do something for the poor, the hungry people, uh, you would uh, buy direct from the farmers, pay them a certain price. For instance, for corn, if you buy a million dollars worth of corn from the farmers and pay them three dollars a bushel, whatever the market price is, okay. then you would be able to write off, you give it to the hungry, you give it to the poor people. Okay. Then you would write off what is considered a parity price or a fair market price which for your, which would be in the neighborhood of around seven dollars. So well, you would get to oh, charge, okay. uh, you, you buy it for three dollars and get to write off seven dollars. So this would be a great benefit not only to the, to the guy with money who wants to help, to the farmer who gets his products sold, and also to the people out there who are hungry who needs the food. It's uh, really ridiculous for people to be starving to death on this planet when there's a lot of food available. Well, what is cannabis? And cannabis, of course, is a medicine. I think it's important to, to say that no medication is going to work for everybody all the time. It's a specific for migraines. It's a specific for seizures. The take on the plant is that it's symbiotic with the human. If you can get something that's natural, that has literally zero side effects. It, it works as a almost a ubiquitous inhibitor of a lot of systems in the brain. The science is absolutely clear. The pharmaceuticalization of cannabis is just beyond the horizon. I think it's easier for men to come out and say they support it. Because women have a lot more on the line, you know, if they're mothers, then they have their kids on the line. So I tried it, and at first, it, you know, it freaked me out. I had a few panic attacks. We know that cannabis can prevent Alzheimer's, and if it can reduce all these ailments and keep your stress level low, that adds years to your life before you're even sick. And so the petrochemical, pharmaceutical, military, industrial, transnational, corporate fascist, lead SOB, vilified the cannabis plant. We're all grown up now. We're not in the closet anymore. We don't give up what you think. We smoke marijuana. 
But once you just let go with it and just be, it does so many things. This uh, consciousness opens the doors of perception, expands consciousness and puts you in a uh, receptive state. I like to say when I give lectures, I start off by saying I smoke pot and I like it a lot. Part of what we're doing with Oregon Normal is trying to uh, maximize the Oregon Medical Marijuana Act and try to help the patients that truly need uh, the medicine. America's ready for a change in the, in the marijuana laws. We're, we're reached critical mass to change this critical mess. Let's hope we can all live together in peace and harmony, love, and uh, legalize marijuana, for God's sake. Come on up here, my brother man, all the way from Kentucky. To tell you some truth, this guy's been doing this longer than Hempfest has been doing this. Give him some warm love. Thank you very much, friend. Hey, thank you all. Listen, I hope you all remember that the theme of this Hempfest is this one's for you, Jack. This one is for Jack Hare. For a lot of you young folks out there, if it wasn't for Jack Hare, you wouldn't be here at this Hempfest because there wouldn't be a Hempfest. Jack Hare is responsible for it. I'm going to take a couple of minutes to pay tribute to my friend Jack Hare, who passed this past several months ago. Here's my tribute to him. Jack Hare is a social and philosophical tsunami. The ripples from whose splash will forever grace the shores of human consciousness in every freedom-loving nation. He is a grand champion of we the people and the natural cycle in our battle with the synthetic subversion which threatens the very concept of the sovereignty of each human individual. Jack's tireless efforts to eliminate the facts about cannabis have furnished freedom fighters everywhere with the tools of knowledge with which to resist the fascism of the corporate state as it seeks to subject everyone to its economic bottom line. Jack recognized that cannabis is a gateway to existentialism, which enlightens our existence and is the basis of our freedom of choice. Yes. He also recognized the miraculous healing powers of this herb, and many sick and dying people have found comfort in its use after reading his wonderful manifesto, The Emperor Wears No Clothes. I am one of them. Jack Hare's grand spirit may have left his worn out body, but he has entered into the hearts and minds of millions of us who will forever be grateful to have been educated by his commitment to the truth. God bless you, Jack Hare. Hey, hey, hey. The message that Jack and I have is that your younger generation are open to perils to which he and I never had to conceive. That there is a great move afoot to take you out of the property of sovereign human beings yes! and put you into the property of the man. The man. The petrochemical, yes! pharmaceutical, military, industrial, transnational, corporate, fascist, elite, son of a bitches. Yes! You see, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights as impediments to the implementation of their new world order and global economy. And they are not warm and fuzzy about you or me or our children or grandchildren. And they are afraid to give everybody in the rest of the world due process and constitutional rights. So in order to make it one world, they're going to take ours away. And the question of him, the question of cannabis, is the most vivid illustration of how this government has overstepped its bounds in policing the private behavior of citizens. When they told us we couldn't plant a hemp seed in the ground, they severed us from the natural cycle. That is what they seek to do. I call it the synthetic subversion, where they want to replace all the natural products on earth that used to be grown out of God's earth and God's seed and replace them with synthetic products and knocked our farmer out of the agrarian society and the agrarian market and made the ghost towns of our small cities and villages across this country. We need to rediscover a cash crop, yes. one that will allow our farmers to go back to the land, one that will allow our farmers to compete with the petrochemical pipelines. You plant U.S. 7% agricultural land in hemp, you would have to import another drop of oil. We can replace the spills in the Gulf. We can replace the uh, environmental catastrophe that the petroleum pipelines have cast upon Mother Earth and instead let our farmers grow hemp as a fuel crop. 
1991, Willie Nelson and I poured hip oil into my Mercedes diesel and drove it across Kentucky in my bed for governor. That's why he started his biofuel plant. Listen, folks, you all have been handed a, a, a torch. Jack Hare, bless his soul, passed away. I'm getting old up here. You know, we cannot make carry this ball much longer. You have to become educated. You have to learn the truth. You have to reach out there and grab the responsibility of maintaining your freedom. Every generation must rewin its own freedoms. And those very sacrifices, right up to the very last second I've been talking to you, made on your behalf, cannot continue anymore. What really counts is your all's commitment to what sacrifices you're willing to make in the future to maintain your freedom. And it's right there in front of you. I encourage you, I encourage you to learn the law. I encourage you to learn the political process. I encourage you to reach out there and take responsibility of your own freedom, live your life like a warrior. God bless you all. Thanks for having me out here in Seattle. The way that we framed it was that there was no current evidence that occasional use, moderate use, which some called recreational use of marijuana by basically psychologically healthy people was harmful. The recommendation of the uh, commission in its first report is that we do not feel that private use or private possession in one's own home should have the stigma of criminalization, that uh, people who experiment should not be criminalized for that particular Behavior. Eventually, we had endorsements from the American Bar Association, from the American Medical Association, from the American Public Health Association, the National Education Association. I'm sure there were many, many others. But mainstream institutions in American society said, yes, this is the right way to go about dealing with this problem. And eventually, over the period from 1973 to 1977, you had uh, uh, 12 states uh, that actually did adopt the commission's recommendation and, and, and decriminalize. President Nixon just wasn't happy with the Schaefer Commission's findings. No, he wasn't, because he had appointed a number of conservatives to the commission, expecting that they would give him information that would justify his calling for a war on drugs. But instead, they came back and recommended decriminalizing marijuana. He did not expect that, nor did he expect that so many of the country's experts and professional associations would agree with that recommendation. I think we have a question from our audience. Yeah. Uh, yes, exactly what does decriminalization mean? The term decriminalization typically means that you don't get arrested, you don't wind up with any sort of criminal record. And in some states there can be no penalty whatsoever for the private possession of small amounts of marijuana by adults. In other states you might have to pay a civil fine like you would for a parking ticket. You know, there was a prior study back in uh, 1938. Mayor LaGuardia of New York commissioned this study on marijuana because he had been acquainted with an army study while he was in the House of Representatives. And in 1944, that study was published saying that, in fact, marijuana was a relatively harmless substance. So twice in recent history, back in the 40s and then with Nixon, politicians have taken information and discarded it and put out false information on marijuana to, to further their political needs. What happens to the legal system when something like this goes on? Well, the result is a loss of respect for the law. And Mayor LaGuardia understood that when he worked so hard for the repeal of prohibition. Prohibition cannot be enforced for the simple reason that the majority of American people do not want it enforced and are resisting its enforcement. That being so, the orderly thing to do under our form of government is to abolish a law which cannot be enforced, a law which the people of the country do not want enforced. In the 1980s, just say no became the new phrase of an old propaganda campaign. 
But it wasn't just Republicans beating the drum of war. In 1986, Speaker of the House Tip O'Neill, a Democrat, saw getting tough on crime as a means for his party to win the upcoming elections. In the 1980s, I was the attorney in the U.S. House of Representatives, principally responsible for writing the drug laws. In the only time in my 10 years at the House of Representatives, we had a bill that we were considering that had never been introduced. There were no hearings. There was no ex expert input from the Justice Department, from the federal judges, from the Bureau of Prisons. We were literally flying blind. And this legislation ended up creating long mandatory minimums of, you know, 10 years mandatory up to life imprisonment when the prior maximum had been 20 years. To say that you deserve up to a year in prison to possess marijuana, that is to possess it for the purpose of using it, is preposterous. It's totally unjust. How these sentences get imposed is completely random on one hand and on the other is very much related to what your social class or race is. These laws fundamentally fail the test of justice. You know, as I look back on it, uh, you know, as a, you know, 30 years as a lawyer, this has been, I mean, if this were intentional, this would be the most shameful thing I could imagine somebody doing as a lawyer. It's terrible. It's terrible to live with. That's why, I, you know, I, it, it's, it's critically important, I think, that people like me speak out and say, these laws are wrong, they're counterproductive, they're unjust. I live in a state that passed a medical marijuana law in the late 90s. My partner and I care for people living with AIDS, and part of that care is providing them with marijuana. Having a warrant served is one of the scariest things that I've ever experienced. Having the battering ram at the door at dawn, jumping out of bed, opening the door, seeing the police there, swarming into the house, handcuffing us while we watch them tear our house apart. We live in fear of losing everything again. I was in my last year of law school and I was convicted of a federal marijuana felony. I had to plead guilty in a plea bargain. I had a house arrest sentence and um, five years probation. I will not be able to run for public office. I have two wonderful kids. I will need to explain to them why I can't vote for the rest of my life, why we can't cross the border. I feel like I have a brand uh, for the rest of my life and I can't get rid of it. I spent 26 years in the New Jersey State Police. 14 of those years I was undercover in narcotics. As a former police officer, I believe that the prohibition of marijuana is one of the most ridiculous abuses of our allocation of police, staff, and money that we could possibly have. We could be allocating our resources toward protecting folks from violent criminals, from child molesters, from drunk drivers, people who are going to kill people. People who are using marijuana are not violent people. Ask any cop whether they would rather go on a call where they know people are high on marijuana or where they, they would rather go on a call where people are high on alcohol. They'll choose marijuana every time. In 2005, the Sentencing Project, a national research organization focused on sentencing laws and incarceration, issued a report that looked at the war on drugs during the 1990s. We talked to one of its authors about their findings. What was so surprising that came out of this study was to find the level of resources that were dedicated to pursuing low-level marijuana offenses. I think conventional wisdom across the country is that uh, our drug war is going after importers, high-level dealers, distributors, um, and that the federal system, which is designed specifically to bring the rich natural resources to bear upon international and high-level drug trafficking, that in fact 
very uh, large proportion of these resources were being funneled towards low-level um, drug users and, and pe per, uh, people in possession of, of primarily marijuana. In fact, what the war on drugs really looks like is shaking down kids in the street, um, grabbing people pulled over on the side of the road, and finding very, very small quantities of marijuana, bringing them into the system, filling out a paperwork, a couple of hours of law enforcement time dedicated to paperwork. And I think that most Americans have no idea that that is where their very precious resources are being directed. Our next speaker is not only the presenting sponsor of Seattle Hemp Fest this year, that's that huge banner, THCF, medical clinic up there. Not only the presenting sponsor of Seattle Hemp Fest just presented us with a check for $25,000, but he's a sponsor of me. Driving back from Oregon Country Fair last year, about four in the morning, I fell asleep at the wheel and I totaled my Explorer. I survived, obviously. And our next sponsor gave me that 2004 Pathfinder that's sitting over there right there. Otherwise, I, Vivian's so broke, I'm an activist, man. I'm so broke, I, couldn't, I didn't even have the money to buy a car. Paul Stanford of the THC Foundation, my good brother, man. Thank you for keeping me rolling, because I know you and I have rolled many together. Give it up to Paul Stanford. And we'll roll some more. Hey, you know, I want to give a big thank you to all of you yeah. folks for hey, being hey. here. A big thank you because, you know, we got to come out of the closet and demand our freedom. We have been put down too long. You know, marijuana prohibition isn't about marijuana. It's not about drugs. That's a smoke screen. That's the, the story. What marijuana prohibition is really about is power and petrochemicals and the continued centralization of economic and political control. So our job is to speak truth to power, and that's what we are here to do. I also want to thank all of those patients out there, because it's only because of you patients coming to our clinics and supporting us that we have the wherewithal to support this and to support the cause. You know, marijuana to me is the Creator's greatest gift to humanity. I believe that marijuana is the plant that produces more fuel, more fiber, more food, and more medicine than any other plant on this planet. If you go back, all archaeologists agree that marijuana, hemp, was the first crop purposely sown by humans. It was definitely among the first crops, and there's some evidence in Central Asia, that cannabis cultivation went back 40,000 years into the past, could well have been the main reason that our ancestors came out of uh, the hunter-gatherer way of life and started to uh, grow crops so they could have their stash. And we still need our stash today. You know, about 75 years ago, the, the industries that were affected, the petrochemical, wood-based paper, the cotton barons of the South, they realized that hemp was gonna displace their economic sustenance. So they came up with the lies that they presented to us as reefer madness, saying that marijuana causes us to go crazy and kill our family and friends. That was the lie they sold to us. We all know that's not true. 20 years of hip fest and there hasn't been any violence. So there's an initiative down here in Washington State. There's a couple of them. Support all of them. Support it. Get out there and get some signatures. And if you can't get signatures, give them money because every dollar you give them is a signature that you didn't go out and get. Every hour you volunteer to help them is $10 they don't have to spend. It comes right down to you and me. So I want to once again thank all you folks for coming out here. I'm proud that we can help and uh, help us restore him.
Keith Straub, my good friend, the founder of the National Organization for the Reform Marijuana Laws, Normal. Give it up! Thank you, um, Vivian and the Hemp Fest. What a wonderful celebration of personal freedom. It's, it's fantastic to be here. Let me start off by being honest with you. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. Okay, let's get that. I first smoked marijuana in 1965 when I was a freshman at Georgetown Law School. And I've been a regular marijuana smoker ever since. And I'm here to say there's absolutely nothing wrong with the responsible use of marijuana by adults, regardless of why you smoke it. And it should be none of the government's business whether we smoke or why we smoke. Normal is the marijuana smokers lobby in America. We have been now for four decades. We were founded and we founded the organization in 1970. We favor the elimination of all penalties for the responsible use of marijuana. We also favor the establishment of a legally regulated market and you good folks here in Washington are gonna have a chance to vote on an initiative like that in November. You may well be the first state to actually fully legalize marijuana in this country. Let's make it happen! And we also favor personal cultivation. That is that consumers should have the right to grow their own marijuana so that if the industry tries to charge us too much, or if the marijuana isn't good quality, or if it's not convenient, screw them. We will grow our own, just like we do now. Now, what is important, I think, is that for those of us who smoke marijuana to get up, stand up, light up, and let the world know how we feel. We must come out of the closet and demand our rights. We have to do that for a number of reasons. First, we have to overcome a negative stereotype that many older Americans still have about marijuana smokers. We need to demonstrate that marijuana smokers are just average Americans who work hard, who raise families, and who pay taxes, and who contribute in a positive way to their communities. We are not criminals, and we should not be treated like criminals. Amen. Just as gays and lesbians demonstrated over the last two or three decades, they won their rights in this country largely by the courageous ability and willingness of a lot of people to come out of the closet, to overcome a negative stereotype. Well, smokers have to do the same thing. So please, there's nothing wrong with smoking pot. Don't be afraid to be identified as a pot smoker, and in fact, Get involved politically. Don't vote for a candidate for public office who wants to treat you like a criminal. Over 30 million Americans smoke pot just in the last year. If we would simply take that pledge to stop voting for people that wanted to treat us like criminals, we will change these laws in the next couple of election cycles. Now, very briefly, prohibition is a failed public policy for two or three basic reasons. One is, we waste $10 billion a year chasing and arresting and prosecuting marijuana smokers. We arrest 850,000 people a year in this country for marijuana offenses. Another marijuana smoker is arrested every 38 seconds in America. We've arrested 20 million marijuana smokers just since 1965. So for Christ's sake, just for that reason, let's move it aside. But there's even a conceptual reason. Most Americans agree. The government has no business coming into our house to know what books we read, to know uh, what music we listen to, or how we conduct ourselves in the privacy of the bedroom. Well, neither do they have any business coming into our house to know whether we drink alcohol or smoke marijuana when we relax in the evening. It is simply none of their business. So, where does that leave us? You folks are on the verge of changing policy that's been in place for 75 years. Either Colorado, California, Washington, Oregon, or Massachusetts, almost certainly one of those states, maybe more, are going to fully legalize marijuana in November of 2012. You people have an excellent chance to do that. You will change the world if you help us accomplish that. And in the, in the end, it is important to keep in mind we're only incidentally talking about marijuana. We're really talking about personal freedom. So get up, light up, 
support normal, and let's restore a measure of personal freedom to the lives of tens of millions of marijuana smokers. Thank you. Keith Strop from Normal, the founder of the National Organization for the Poor Marijuana Law. Well, here's a little song that you might get along with, all about a natural seed. Growing wild by the side of the roadway, it's nature's a wonderful weed. Been around so long, it's hard to tell why anyone would think it's new. Love it or hate it, however you relate it, I'll leave that up to you. But isn't that righteous? And isn't that good enough? Ain't that the way it ought to be? Isn't that righteous? And isn't that good enough? Righteous is good enough for me. History's locked in a cardboard box and it's hard to take a look. With sidetrack frills and fantasies all written all over the book. Everybody tells you what to think and they've got their reasons why You gotta pick reality up by the scruff of the neck and look it right in the eye And isn't that righteous? Isn't that good enough? Ain't that the way it ought to be? Isn't that righteous? And isn't that good enough? Righteous is good enough for me Now the same people that are spreading the fear The same people that scare me the most you know, some of them look like they just as soon like they're hanging from a lamp post. They talk about what it does to your brain. Well, I just have to react. Cause Hitler never touched the stuff, and that's an actual fact. And isn't that righteous? Isn't that good enough? Ain't that the way it ought to be? Isn't that righteous? And isn't that good enough? Righteous is good enough for me. George Washington was the father of our country and he had a hemp plantation. Betsy Ross used it to make the flag that flew above the baby nation. They wrote their declarations on paper from that same hemp fiber press. And I don't know what they spoke when they were taking a break, but I got a pretty good guess. And isn't that righteous? Isn't that good enough? Ain't that the way it ought to be? Isn't that righteous? Isn't that good enough? Righteous is good enough for me. Isn't that righteous? And isn't that good enough? 
Jesus is good enough for me.
Wisconsin, hemp is harvested in September. Here, the hemp harvester with automatic spreader is standard equipment. Note how smoothly the rotating apron lays the swath preparatory to retting. Here, it is a common and essential practice to leave headlands around hemp fields. These strips may be planted to other crops, preferably small grain. Thus, the harvester has room to make its first round without preparatory hand cutting. Here, the machine is running over corn stubble. When the cutter bar is much shorter than the hemp is tall, overlapping occurs. Not so good for retting. The standard cut is eight to nine feet. The length of time hemp is left on the ground to ret depends on the weather. The swaths must be turned to get a uniform ret. When the woody core breaks away readily, like this, the hemp is about ready to take up and bind into bundles. Well retted hemp is light to dark gray. The fiber tends to pull away from the stalk. The presence of stalks in the bowstring stage indicates that retting is well underway. When hemp is short or tangled, or when the ground is too wet for machines, it is bound by hand. A wooden buck is used. Twine will do for tying, but the hemp itself makes a good band. When conditions are favorable, the pickup binder is commonly used. The swaths should lie smooth and even with stalks parallel. The picker won't work well in tangled hemp. After binding, hemp is shocked as soon as possible to stop further retting. In 1942, 14,000 acres of fiber hemp were harvested in the United States. The goal for 1943 is 300,000 acres. Thus, hemp, cannabis sativa, the old standby cordage fiber, is staging a strong comeback. This is Kentucky hemp going into the dryer of a mill at Versailles. In the old days, breaking was done by hand, one of the hardest jobs known to man. Now the power breaker makes quick work of it. Spinning American hemp into rope yarn or twine in the old Kentucky River Mill at Frankfort, Kentucky. Another pioneer plant that has been making cordage for more than a century. Such plants will presently be turning out products spun from American-grown hemp. Twine of various kinds for tying, winding armatures, and upholsterers work. Rope for marine rigging and towing, for hay forks, derricks, and heavy-duty tackle. Light-duty fire hose. Thread for shoes for millions of American soldiers and parachute webbing for our paratroopers. Tune in next week. We'll show. be back Let's and help us restore hemp.
Make me want to grow merry ganja. <laughs> Stick it in the ground, water it down, merry ganja. That's right, marijuana. Mm -hmm. Ganja, me like Mary Ganja. Mm -hmm. Ganja, me like to use Mary Ganja. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For foods and medicine, prohibition must end Mary Ganja. Mary Ganja. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Take it away, man. <laughs>